Hello friends, welcome to the final video of our very first web series. My name is Adrian Lee, you know me as the Wandering Art Historian, and you've been following along for a number of weeks now as we have been discussing our very first web series together, how to read a painting. Of course, we've been looking at all the different clues colors and symbols, and we are wrapping up our series with a discussion of repeated stories seen time and time again throughout art history. What will our topic be today? Well, today's topic is genre and moral stories, and you've actually seen a couple examples of genre and moral stories already in previous videos. For example, you remember when we talked about this? Yeah, this is the painting we discussed when we were talking about symbols hidden in plain sight. Remember, this was the painting Beware of Luxury by Jan Steen from around 1663-ish. And we said that this, with the title Beware of Luxury and all of these symbols crammed into this one painting, we were discussing how the Dutch, especially during the Baroque period, love to warn us about what not to do with our lives, right? They were always presenting the negative example, as in, do not do this, right? Okay, we talked about all the different symbols and all the different craziness that was going on here. So we're gonna keep going down that path for a little while, because I've got a really, really cool genre and moral story to show you, but I wanna give you a couple examples first. And yes, all of these are gonna be from the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting, one of my favorite time periods. So let's dive in. Here we have just a wonderful um, drinking painting, if you will. What the heck is going on here, you may ask? Well, let's talk about it. This is a painting by Judith Leister, yes, a lady artist. And um, let's read this painting together and see what Judith is trying to warn us about. She's telling us to not do something with this painting. Let's see if we can figure it out. So we have our two figures here. Um, clearly they are at a tavern because this gentleman here on the right has a stein and he's holding it upside down to show that it's definitely empty. So he is out of his adult beverage for the evening. But boy, he's still having a great time, so I'm having a feeling that um, he's probably had a few of those adult beverages already. He's smoking a pipe, his hat's all askew. Do you notice that his shirt has become unbuttoned a little bit, so he's a little, you know, unkempt? And he's in bright red, so that we don't miss him, right? He's had the best night out, I, I for sure, right? His buddy over here is sitting on a stool and he's kicking back this drinking gourd. Glug, glug, glug. That's the sound I imagine that it makes, I'm sure. Um, what a wonderful evening. Um, do you see anything else somewhat suspicious? Yeah. Did you notice Creepy McCreeperson's skeleton man here in the background? What? What's he doing back there? Well, let's see, he's back there. He's very interested in this gentleman kicking back that drinking gourd, right? In his hand, he holds an hourglass, and in his other hand, he holds a skull and a candle. Now, let's put all those things together. What do you think the artist, Judith Laster is warning us about? Um, I would have to say she probably doesn't want us to go out getting excessively intoxicated or having drunken behavior in public, things of that nature. And that would make sense because she did title this painting, The Last Drop. And I gotta say, that sounds a little ominous, right? The Last Drop? Probably justifying why Scary McScary Pants, the skeleton is here. Think about what she is saying. When you get excessively drunk and intoxicated like this, and you're clamoring for the very last drop, what if it was your last drop ever? Yeah, what if 
death was just hanging out in the background waiting for you. Super creepy, right? So here we've got our skeleton man and with the symbol of the hourglass quite literally saying time is running out, right? Through the, the sands, through the hourglass, that whole thing. Do we see the candle lit? Now, when we have candles in the Dutch Baroque period, a lot of times they are included in still life paintings and what have you, as if they've been blown out, the transience of life. That's how quickly your life can be extinguished. Again, super creepy and morbid. Do you notice that the skeleton holds yet another skull? Why? Why two skulls? That's because we have two friends out drinking. So while this guy is here hanging out with this guy, he's got a skull for the friend. Oof. Yeah, don't do it. Don't hang out at this bar, that's for sure. Uh, and thus, an example of a genre or moral story telling us what not to do in the creepiest way possible. Let's look at another one, shall we? This is actually an etching. Um, this is by Jan van de Velde II from about fifth, uh, excuse me, 1613 to 1620-ish. And if you're like, well, this is just a lovely couple. They're exquisitely dressed. They have sat down for lunch. They have beautiful objects. Clearly they are wealthy and high status. But do you notice Creepy McCreeperson in the background? Yes, another skeleton holding yet another hourglass, this one with wings. So what is the title of this particular painting? This is titled, again, creepy, Death Surprising a Young Couple. Um, yikes, what is the point of something like this? This is telling us to really don't, again, get caught up in the things of this world, the earthly monetary wealth and uh, fancy objects and fancy dinners and clothes. Don't get caught up in that because death is closer than you know. Make sure your soul is right. Make sure you're living a good, happy, positive life. Focus on your faith and things of that nature. To drive this point home, this artist has included a saying, a phrase at the bottom of this etching, which says what? We often sit in luxury while death is closer than we know. Yikes. Yes, the Dutch were a little morbid at this time, weren't they? Yeah, a little creepy. Um, but since we're in the mode of creepiness, that brings us to our main topic. I'm not gonna tell you the title or the subject matter of this particular painting that I'm about to show you. I want to read it with you, looking at colors and symbols and see if we can figure out what is going on and what it's trying to warn us against. Are you ready for this? Okay, can you guess what's going on here? Let's read this painting together. Um, I'm gonna start on the far right. Join me. So let's look at this nice lady. First of all, do you notice she's incredibly well lit? In fact, she's the best uh, or most well lit figure of the entire painting, right? These two figures are kind of in shadow, but she is beautifully lit. And she is a lovely young woman. Um, her hair is a little bit askew. It's not smoothed in and perfect. She's got a lot of full, uh, feathers in her hair. Um, do we notice her um, chest region is exposed, her delicatage, if you will. Um, also want to point out that over this blue dress, she has a yellow colored wrap around her. Um, she is playing a lute. Okay, let's look at this gentleman here. It's hard to tell because he's in shadow, but do you see that he's in completely in the color red? Um, do we see that he also has feathers in his cap? Um, he's looking at this lady very joyfully, excitedly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you notice that the candle, we don't see the light source itself, but we know it is positioned right here because we see the flame and how that's kind of associated with this gentleman right here. Yep. Do we see that he's holding a bag in one hand and he's handing this nice lady some gold coins? And then we have this lady here on the far left. She's older than both of these figures. She seems pretty happy about this conversation here. And she is pointing at the two young people. So let me ask you, what's going on in this scene? Hmm? Is it something nefarious? Maybe. Um, this is what one would call a procurus scene. Um, and it is depicting a scene of prostitution. Yes, that young lady is the prostitute. This gentleman here is the John. And this lady here is the madam. And I know what you're thinking, Adrian, the Dutch during the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting were strict Calvinists. They were wildly religious. Um, idle hands are the devil's playground. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Why on earth would they paint a painting depicting a prostitution scene? Well, number one, again, it's a genre or moral story showing us what not to do, okay? But second of all, under that umbrella of, hey, I'm depicting what not to do, it kind of justifies the idea of, hey, I'm gonna paint this lady with her mm, chest exposed or what have you. It's a little kind of a double-sided coin here, right? Where even the artist is being a little sketch about it, yeah. So what were our clues to tell us that this was a procuracine? And this particular procu pro excuse me, procuracine was from 1625 and is by uh, Gerard von Honthorst. Well, number one, our young lady, her hair is unkempt, but she has a lot of uh, feathers in her hair. Feathers in one's cap or hair were a sign of loose morals at this time, thus the feathers and the cap of the gentleman as well. Um, her chest being exposed like that, clearly a reference to her being a prostitute. Again, we see the yellow uh, wrap around her dress and in our discussion on the color yellow, we talked about it being associated with the idea of betrayal. So why would it be used here? Well, because the man might be in love with the lady, but she's not really in love with him, right? This is just a business transaction, right? So that might be the betrayal being referenced here by the artist. What's the deal with the lute? Well, music in art is often represented, uh, representative of romance, okay? However, for the Dutch, the playing of the lute was definitely associated with sex, lusty, lusty sex, okay? And thus we see the lute with the prostitute in a lot of procura scenes, okay? Um, again, our gentleman clothed entirely in red, filled with passion and love and lust. He's holding the bag of coins and offering them to her. The flame aligns with him as another illustration of his passion and lust. And this lady's super happy to have procured this gentleman's uh, entertainment for the evening, right? But you're like, Adrian, this is such a, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the Dutch can't have painted dozens of these paintings. Could they have? Yes, they sure could have. We're not gonna look at a dozen, but we're gonna look at quite a few. Here is another depiction, this one by Dirk von Barberen. Do you see it now? Absolutely, right? We have even the same uh, symbols and clues. Here's our young lady. Her hair is uncovered, even though it looks pretty well kept right here, you know, coiffed. Um, however, she's got a little bit of exposure going on here, a nip slip, if you will. Um, this dude, definitely the feathers in his cap. But boy, he's getting a little clingy and grabby. Yikes. 
handing her the coin while she is playing the lute, right? She's happy, he's happy, and the procuress is uh, hammering out the details. I like that she's in the faded yellow because she is the betrayer in this one, orchestrating um, uh, the events that will take place um, in the evening. Let's look at another one. I'm telling you, there are tons of these. Um, yeah, uh, what the heck is this? Another procurer scene. Um, here we're probably in a fancier tavern. Look at this beautiful table carpet um, with a fancy um, wine jug or um, vase here. Um, our prostitute, again, in yellow, even though she's perfectly covered. Do you notice that the John, again, completely in red, lust, passion, love, right? With the gold coin, he has a feather in his cap. He also... Uh, getting a little grabby, sir. Wait just a minute. Here we have our procurus, making sure everything is um, moving along nicely. Um, what's this here? This is actually the upper handle of a lute. So she looks like she has just handed the lute to this gentleman so that she can accept the coin from her John. But then we've got this weirdo. Who's this guy looking out at us, smiling with his glass of adult beverage? Who is this? Well, this is a procurus scene, but truly, this is a painting by Vermeer. Definitely doesn't match his normal fare of domestic home scenes of Dutch life, and Art historians believe that this gentleman here is Vermeer himself. He's painted himself into a procurus scene. Why the heck would he do something like that? We're not 100% sure. We don't know. Vermeer did have 11 kids and died at like 43-ish. But I, I don't know if any of that contributes to this or vice versa. But it's all speculation. Um, but it is kind of creepy to paint yourself into a procurus scene. Yikes. Let me show you another painting. All right, now this one's a little tricky. We've been talking about the procurus as a genre or moral story, but is that what we see happening here? And I gotta tell you, this one's a little tricky to read, okay? So first of all, very dark background, right? It's very difficult to see. Um, and do you see the lines because it's been aged and the paint and the, uh, the, the covering, the lacquer, the veneer is starting to crack, right? Over time. And I will point out that we are in someone's bedchamber, okay? Because that's what this thing is here, this red thing with the posts. This is a curtained bedchamber. We've seen that a couple of times in a few paintings already. We do have three figures though. A young man, this lady who looks a little bit older, and then we see the back of this young lady. A gorgeous silver dress, very unusual. Um, we have a candle that's been blown out. Hmm. We have a book, a bell, a different a ribbon. Just a few things that you might find in a, in a, in a bedchamber in your bedroom. Um, but, but do we have all of our clues? I, I don't know. Let me tell you the story behind this particular painting, okay? For a number of years, this painting was titled The Paternal Admonition, okay? Um, why is that? Well, because looking at this, Art historians and people were not 100% sure what was really go on, going on here. What's the story being told? So they believed that with the way the gentleman's hand is raised and the way that this figure's head is bowed, they believed that this was a man chastising his daughter for some reason, the paternal admonition. However, is that what's really going on? So this artist... Gerard de Terborc, um, who is Dutch, got a lot of commissions 
for this particular painting and for this depiction with these figures and what have you. So he painted this composition quite a few times, okay? Uh, one of these times, uh, they decided to um, study the painting. Uh, one of these versions, they decided to study the painting a little bit closer and use science to look through all the layers of paint and they found something interesting. By analyzing this painting, they discovered that in this gentleman's hand, he actually held a gold coin. And if you're saying that's, that's the key to unlocking this painting, I would agree with you because that gives us a whole different tone to the story here. Think about this. Here we have a younger gentleman with feathers in his cap. We see that he has a sword implying that he is a soldier. And for the Dutch to imply that he was a soldier would also imply that the soldier visited maybe some unseemly places. It's kind of like that uh, phrase, a uh, sailor has a girl in every port, that kind of thing. Um, they also point out, well, this lady looks to be too much, too, too old to be married to this guy, right? The age difference doesn't seem quite right. Um, plus we're in somebody's bed chamber. So we are having some of these clues that do allude to the fact that maybe it shouldn't be called the paternal admonition at all. They've since retitled it the gallant conversation, but I think they should just come out with it and say, it's another procuracine because that gold coin is like the cherry on top, right? I also wanna point out a very interesting symbol. Do you see this poor, sad, pathetic dog off to the side here? That looks like the mangiest, saddest, thinnest, poor creature I've ever seen in my life. But we've seen the symbol of the puppy in a few paintings already associated with what? Fido means fidelity and loyalty primarily in what? In marriage. So if the happy sleeping puppy is a, a, a sort of blessing or a symbol of a happy marriage, this poor sad creature is probably referencing the idea that these are not married people and not in a happy relationship, but that it's probably a prostitution scene, right? How interesting is that? One last painting for us to discuss. What's going on here? Hmm? Mm hmm hmm We've been talking about the Procurus genre and moral story. Is this a Procurus scene? Well, do we have the clues? Do we have all of the symbols? Let's read it together. First of all, big gap here on the far right of the painting, definitely drawing attention to the fact that we only have two figures. Where is the third figure, the madam who would be arranging the night's events, right? We don't have that with this particular painting, but we have this young lady. Um, I have to say, she doesn't look like any of the other prostitutes, does she? This lady actually is hard at work on her sewing. Her hair is perfectly coiffed. She's buttoned up to the neck and to the wrist. We see no skin exposed on this young lady. She's got a long skirt. Her feet are being warmed by this little portable device here that would have warm coals in it. And you could put your dress over it and heat from underneath. So that's a cool thing. But it also implies that it's probably cold and she can't really leave the situation here. Do we notice that she is in white and blue? White often associated with the purity of the Virgin Mary and blue with spirituality or divinity. Hmm. Here we have this gentleman. Um, he's a little grabby. Why does he need to touch her? I don't know. But he is also holding out a handful of golden coins. He's looking at her very intently but she is definitely giving him the cold shoulder, wouldn't you say? 
Um, she is close to this flame, which lines up with him, right? Um, but she's using the flame to work by. So I have to ask you, is this truly a Procurus scene? We have some of the clues. Is it like this situation where something has been lost to time, like the gold coin? Not exactly. This particular painting is titled The Proposition, but it's by our girl Judith Laster, who also painted The Last Drop. So here we have a female painter reinterpreting the idea of the Procurus scene. And what is she saying about the Procurus scene itself? What about this story that we've come to look for the typical clues? I think what she is trying to say is it doesn't always play out like that. It's not always orchestrated by some madam, right? What if this is a servant girl trying to get her mending done and this is the man of the house or a friend of the man of the house, her master? She's being offered more gold coins than she'll ever earn, but clearly she is not interested in this gentleman at all. She's really focused on completing her work. And this is why we need to really pay attention to the clues, the symbols, the colors, and the repeated stories. Because what we see here is a big difference. We can look at the two scenes and say, is it really a Procurus scene or not? Because once we know the story of the Procurus, and we've seen it depicted a few times already just today, we know what to look for. So when an artist does something different, their own interpretation, it makes us stop. It makes us take note. We have to acknowledge the creative artistic choices made by that particular artist. And I have to say, it's pretty profound when you look at the, all of the paintings we've looked at thus far were by men. And all of them depicted a very joyful, happy prostitute, right? But in this image depicted by Judith Laster, a woman artist, she's saying it's not always that easy. It's not always somebody, a madam pulling the strings behind the scenes. It's a complicated situation. And maybe this young lady is put into a position that she doesn't really want to be in. I think that's probably why she titled it The Proposition instead of The Procurus, right? Thank you so much for going on this epic journey with me. I think we've done like 15 videos all about how to read a painting. It's been so joyful for me. I hope you've been enjoying yourself. If you have a dollar or two to donate to my virtual tip jar, that would be incredible. And it would mean so much to me. Um, if you can, please be sure to like these videos, maybe throw out a comment. Um, if you could share these videos with your friends, that would be awesome. And if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel, that would be fantastic because I'm pretty sure that this is not our last time together. So stay tuned for more videos coming up. My name is Adrian Lee. You know me as the Wandering Art Historian. Thank you for going on this adventure through art with me. I'll see you again soon.